Good evening, everyone. I'm, <laughs> I'm Amy Miller, Executive Director of Atlanta Celebrates Photography. Welcome to what promises to be yet another great ACP event. As you know, we've got outstanding programs all month long, including a film screening tomorrow night at the Goat Farm, our third annual photo book fair on Saturday at Piedmont Park, a lecture by Zoe Strauss next Thursday at the Atlanta Contemporary Arts Center, and the final installation of our public art project by Monica Cook next Saturday at Grant Park, where we will also be partnering with the galleries of I-45 to screen the winners of the Guggenheim Museum's YouTube Play competition. For details on all of these events and many more, check out our festival guide online at acpinfo.org, or you can pick up a copy. We have a few left as you leave tonight. Adding to our embarrassment of riches, don't miss Glenn Lowry, director of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and world-renowned photographer Thomas Struth for a rare public dialogue where they will discuss the role of the museum in Struth's work and in our changing globalized world. This event will take place on Tuesday, November 1st in Symphony Hall. You can purchase tickets by calling the High Museum or visiting high.org. Before we get started tonight, I'd like to thank the High Museum of Art for hosting us this evening in the Woodruff Arts Center. And I'd like to thank the Fulton County Arts Council, the Metropolitan Atlanta Arts Fund, the Georgia Council for the Arts, and the City of Atlanta Office of Cultural Affairs for their support. And I'd also like to thank each of you who support ACP through volunteering, through making donations, and by attending our events. We wouldn't be here without you, so thank you. Our mission is to support Atlanta's emergence as an international center for photography. We bring internationally known guest speakers to Atlanta, and we do that all the time, and it's great for everyone, but we would be way off the mark if we didn't recognize or highlight some of our successful photographers here at home. Tonight we will share in a conversation between Atlanta photographer Chip Simone and the High Museum's curator of photography, Brett Abbott. Together, they will take an in-depth look at the work in the resonant image photographs by Chip Simone, which is on view here at the High Museum through November 6. Brett Abbott joined the High as the curator of photography in April 2011. Brett came from the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles, where he served as associate curator in the Department of Photographs. He recently received the 2010 Lucy Award for Curator Exhibition of the Year for his organization of the exhibition and its related publication, Engaged Observers, Documentary Photography Since the 60s. That show is the Getty's highest attended photography exhibition to date. Abbott also received the 2007 Lucy Award for Curator Exhibi Exhibition of the Year for Edward Weston, Enduring Vision, and its edited publication, Edward Weston, Book of Nudes. Abbott received his Master of Arts in History from Williams College in 2002, and his Master of Arts in the same field from Stanford University. Chip Simone has been exhibiting photographs for more than four decades. Has it been that long? <laughs> he was educated in the visual arts and the history and traditions of creative photography at the world-renowned Rhode Island School of Design, where he studied with American master Harry Callahan. In 1973, he was a founding member of Nexus. Some of you remember Nexus, Atlanta's first photography gallery. In 1980, his work was exhibited at the Winter Olympic Games in Lake Placid in New York. In 1982, he received a photographer's fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. In 1985, the French Ministry of Culture exhibited his photographs in the cities of Paris and Toulouse as part of the Atlanta-France Cultural Exchange. In 1996, Chip published On Common Ground, photographs from the crossroads of the New South, with a foreword by former Atlanta Mayor Andrew Young. Chip Simone's photographs are in the permanent collections of the High Museum of Art, the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, the Corcoran Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., the Houston Museum of Fine Art, the Museum of Contemporary Art of Georgia, the Worcester Historical Museum, and the Sir Elton John Collection. Please join me in welcoming Brett Abbott and Chip Simone.
Thank you very much, uh, Amy. And uh, good evening. I did bring a few questions with me here, but um, those of you who know Chip um, know that I may not need too many of them, uh, and that's what we're counting on here. He's a lively, uh, uh, lively talker, so we're going to have a great time this evening. Um, I do want to say um, that this was the the first exhibition that I took on when I arrived at the at the high in April. Um, it was on the schedule, but um, not a whole lot had been done on it, I mean, except for Chip sort of thinking and winnowing down his body of work that he would present to us. And um, it was a really wonderful experience for me, um, because not only because Chip is a great photographer and a really lovely person to work with, but um, he's very connected to the community here. And working on this got me engaged with all of you. Um, from people who supported the book to uh, people who lent to the exhibition and, and those of you who um, are in APG and other photography groups um, that Chip is involved with. So it's really been, been a nice opportunity for me and I just wanted to thank Chip for, for introducing me to Atlanta. Well, you're very welcome and uh, can you hear me okay? Uh, and I learned also from the same experience how fortunate we are to have Brett join us uh, as a uh, photography curator at the High. Um, it was almost unfair to have him walk into this half-assembled project uh, and saying, okay, here you go, this is what we're gonna do. And I explained uh, what sort of the, the overview of the project was and he very quickly picked up on what we were uh, uh, trying to do with it. And it was a, it was a great dialogue between us uh, it, was, it was a wonderful uh, way to organize the exhibit. Uh, we, we were quite compatible in the way we were able to select work and then to organize the exhibition and uh, design the installation, uh, which you see, for those of you that, uh, that haven't seen it, uh, that's, that's one of the, the nicest things about it, is the way it was so beautifully installed. And uh, uh, Brett and I spent uh, the better part of two days working on that and then the, uh, the great staff of people that work here at the museum that install the pictures and light the, light, light the pictures and put on the labels and all of those great individuals did a, a, just a superb job. So I'm very proud uh, to have worked with Brett and to uh, have worked with all of the people here at the museum and I'm very grateful to all of them. So by way of a little bit of background for those of you who may not have been into the galleries yet and I hope you all will go in if you haven't, um, Chip's you know, worked as a photographer for many, several decades, three, four decades now. And 35 years of that was really dedicated primarily to black and white gelatin silver photography. And he'll talk a little bit about when he got introduced to color in the 80s, but uh, it really, it wasn't until 2000 that he took up digital photography and really went head on into color. And he's been doing that for about 10 years now. And what we have, up in the galleries is a sort of survey of the past 10 years of his work. Um, so I think my first question for Chip would be, here we are, we're sitting uh, in the auditorium at the High Museum, you've got a great show up on the walls. How does it feel and um, would you do anything differently? Oh, it feels wonderful. I mean, I can't begin to describe uh, how thrilling it all is. Uh, it was kind of nerve-wracking for a while because it's a it's a huge it's a huge thing for a person to have an opportunity like this, and even though I've been doing it for a long time and it's not the first, this is the second time that I've had a show, uh, a museum show, but the the previous time was a very different kind of body of work. Uh, there are a couple of pictures in in this group that uh, that I'll show you uh, from from that, but that's in, uh, was in the uh, Worcester Historical Museum in my hometown which now has 92 pictures uh, of mine in their ar permanent archive, and that was a project funded by the National Endowment. Uh, but here, here in my, home, my hometown, not my home, the town where we live uh, for 40 years, uh, to uh, have the opportunity to uh, present the work to the community that I'm, I've been a part of all of this, all of this time, 
has really been a, a, a great thrill. And uh, I've learned an awful lot uh, as it's gone along. I've learned an awful lot more about my work and, and as people uh, comment on it and I uh, realize how other people respond to it. And I've been making a point to come to the museum a few times a week and hang around in the gallery and, and talk to the folks that come in. And that's been one of the best parts of it all because I, I get to talk to folks who had never seen the work before uh, and uh, in most cases haven't had an opportunity to talk to a person who's made the work that they're looking at. So we've had some wonderful conversations and it's been great meeting people from the community as well. Um, Chip, I do, I'd want us to talk a little bit about your, um, the work that is on view, but before we go there, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you, how you became a photographer, how you got into this field, and what some of the projects that you worked on were before you, you switched to digital color that we have up in, in the museum right now. Um, I, th I think people in, uh, of, of my generation, I'm, uh, I was born in 1945, and I used, to, I used to begin talking about my work by saying, well, you know, when I was 11 years old, I got a camera for Christmas. And uh, then I found out that around that time, Kodak was heavily marketing cameras to a lot of people because I met a lot of photographers who had a similar experience. They started around the same time. They got their first camera. Uh, they became uh, very infatuated with the visual world. And it also coincides with the uh, growth of television as a constant uh, in our culture. And uh, I think looking at pictures in picture frames, moving pictures on television, had an awful lot to do with uh, cultivating my, or certainly uh, uh, starting my visual curiosities. Uh, and how and about I, picture magazines too? Well, Life magazine, sure. I mean, when I was uh, 10 or 11 years old, I wanted to be Alfred Eisenstadt. He was my hero. Uh, I wanted a Leica camera. I wanted a, a trench coat, a passport, uh, and a life of uh, an exciting life running around the world photographing uh, all of the, the action. Didn't quite work out that way uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, most of which turned out to be good ones. But f uh, all through my high school years, I carried a camera with me every day. Uh, I loved to shoot available light. I'd like to shoot in the manner of a photojournalist because uh, that was my goal. And. Uh, uh, I had, by the time I graduated from high school, I had run through about four different cameras. Never developed a roll of film myself. I mean, that was, as I understood it, that was for laboratory people to do. Because mm -hmm. uh, that's the way it, it happened at Life Magazine. And, uh, uh, but then I had the, great, the, the, the greatest good fortune of my life was to uh, go to the Rhode Island School of Design. And uh, when I was 19 years old, I met Harry Callahan. And uh, that changed everything. I had no idea that people like him existed. Uh, I, I had uh, difficulty trying to move over into the, the sort of behavioral mode that uh, he advocated, which was just to go off and find your own pictures as opposed to go off and work on somebody else's project. But that really changed everything. And uh, uh, it was probably the biggest blessing in my life was to have Callahan as a mentor and as a teacher. And, and when you had that experience, I mean, Callahan's something of a legend today, a major figure in the history of photography, right. not just for his own work, but because he influenced so many people as a, as a teacher. Did you realize when you went there what you were getting into? I mean, did you know how special of, a, of an experience this was? Uh, no, on the contrary. Uh, Harry was very soft-spoken. Um, he, he didn't like to talk very much at all in general. Uh, he was kind of awkward talking about photography. And uh, he just wanted people to go out and make pictures and, he f and really to become their own teachers, to pay attention to the work that they did. Uh, there, are, there are lots of uh, famous stories about Harry's reluctance to speak. And I'll tell you one. Uh, there was a f uh, back in the 60s, uh, probably the top r ranked, if, if there was a ranking, uh, architectural photographer in the country was named Ezra, Ezra Stoller. Uh, he was uh, quite renowned. He was all the top architects in the country used him, and at the time he was paid like two thousand dollars a day back in the '60s. That was serious money. And uh, 
we got a, we meaning the, the department at RISD, got a grant from the uh, Hallmark people to bring Stoller to teach us, my, my group, uh, architectural photography to give us a, an assignment. And uh, the School of Design is located immediately next to, uh, in Providence, Rhode Island, immediately across the street from the First Baptist Church. It's not a First Baptist Church. It was the First Baptist Church in America. It's a historical church. So that was our assignment, was to photograph this on the exterior and interior of this church. And we used view cameras and did architectural correction and had to learn all of that stuff. And uh, Stoller came three times, once to give the assignment, once to have a preliminary critique, and then to have a final critique. And there were only seven of us in the group uh, in my class, uh, which included myself and Linda Connor, whom I'm sure many of you have heard of, uh, and some others. And uh, uh, th the deal was that we would pass the work around. Harry would look at it first and make some kind of utterance as a comment on it. Say, gee, that's nice, that's neat, that's not so hot. I mean, that's what he would say about pictures. And Stoller was from New York, and he was a high-powered New York guy, you know, and was used to talking back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth, and we were just sitting there like bumps. Uh, and uh, he, Stoller became very frustrated. And finally he, he said, what's wrong with you people? Don't you ever talk about your pictures? And Callahan looked very sheepish, and, uh, and said, no, we mostly sort of grunt, uh, <laughs> which was true. You know, you'd walk up and you'd say, oh, gee, that's you know, uh, nice. But, but we never really got into a conversation uh, about the work in the way that s some of us are perhaps now accustomed uh, to going into psychological issues and environmental issues and historical issues. It wasn't like that at all. It was, uh, it was a picture that either, either touched you or it didn't. And uh, uh, so for three years, you dealt with a guy like that. But you found out that when he said something like, gee, that's really nifty, uh, that was the highest praise he, that this guy could give you. And, and if he said that often enough, it's like you could hear the seraphim singing, you know, <laughs> breaking through the clouds, the light. You know, it was really uh, quite marvelous because he, f he meant it with all of his heart. And... Uh, uh, in fact, the, what you learned from Callahan was that it was more about feeling the picture than understanding the picture in some, at some intellectual level. It was much more visceral and much more emotional. Uh, and that was one of the great lessons that we get from him. Mm -hmm. and, and, and finding yourself, finding your own. The, what, was, what was critical to him was that you found your own way of making a picture. Uh, over and over and over again, it's a, that you have to find your own way. Keep working on it until you find the picture that, that's your picture, and then you'll be on to something. And uh, that's, I mean, I, I almost just said that's all he wanted, but that, that was asking a lot, because it, it meant that you had to really pay attention to the work that you did and pay attention to the work around you, because everybody else, and uh, in addition to me and Linda, was uh, John McWilliams and Emmett Gowan and Bill Burke, uh, uh, a fellow named Murray Reese, who ended up up in Nashville, I think. But, but there, it was a pretty intense group. It was small, but, but very intense. Uh, and we really didn't care to talk too much about photography. We, uh, we were really about making pictures and then making more pictures. And you'd look at your work and you'd use those as stepping stones to decide where you were going to go next, uh, and, uh, and so on and so forth, so that the process of, of uh, having a life in photography was to allow your pictures to sort of make the map uh, f for you. you. You, Callahan never gave you a map of uh, how to become a good photographer, except to say, go out and keep making pictures and it'll come. And as it turns out, he was right. Did you find that um, being together not just with Callahan, but with people like Emmett Gowan or Linda Connor or was influential for you in any way? Or are there other photographers that you look to then or now that, that you were um, particularly taken by, either historical figures or, or ones working now? Well, it was, it was all new to me, and in, in, I'm talking about in the early 60s, 1963, 64. Uh, I didn't know who Ansel Adams was, which may sound as a huge shock to a lot of you. But, uh, I mean, it took a, a long time for me to figure out who Ansel Adams was. 
but Minor White was teaching up, uh, up the street, uh, so to speak, up in uh, Cambridge, and uh, uh, Henry Holmes Smith was at Indiana, Peter Bunnell was starting a photography program at, at Princeton, uh, Siskin was still teaching in Chicago, uh, and it was a fairly small group. There were only a few hundred photography students in the whole country at that time, F far fewer than there are here in Atlanta at this point in time, uh, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, so, and there was only one history of photography book, and th that was the scariest thing, because it was Beaumont Newhall's famous history of photography, because the last picture in the book was by Harry Callahan, uh, and that was really spooky, because here was my teacher in the history book, and I was trying to figure out why, because I was still very young, and I didn't understand uh, an, an awful lot about uh, what was going on, but all that mattered to Harry, he didn't care if I understood that, he only cared that I was passionate about making pictures and would go out every day and make pictures. And as long as I did that, he would encourage me and, and uh, uh, was convinced that I would be okay, that it would, it would happen. I would be driven by passion and not by uh, uh, some other lesser issue. And when did you uh, come to Atlanta? Was it, was it after your, your training at RISD? And, and what uh, were yes. some of the first projects that you embarked well, on when me, you got here? Let me back up again one, one second. Uh, when, uh, when I was uh, 11, I got my first camera. But before that, I fell in love with a, with a camera that had a broken viewfinder on it. Uh, it the camera was broken, but the viewfinder uh, actually worked, and I would carry it around and look at everything through that little viewfinder, just carry it in my pocket. And, and I began to realize that the lens, as represented by the viewfinder, could, could transform uh, everything, anything, uh, into a picture. And I, and I still use that as, as a guiding principle in the work that I do. Uh, photography itself is very powerful as a transformative uh, pr uh, process. And in the, work that I, in the work that I do, and certainly in the work, uh, more recent work that you see in, in the exhibit next door, I try to find things that, that photography converts into something more potent, something stronger, uh, something uh, uh, more mysterious, uh, something more condensed and rich. Uh, and photography itself has the capability of releasing the poetic nature of uh, things that we take uh, for granted as ordinary things. But if you look at them through the power of the lens, uh, you can sometimes reveal uh, something unexpected to the viewer uh, who gets a chance to see them. Mm -hmm. uh, I had been teaching at a university out in the Midwest after I got out of RISD. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I spent four years on the prairie, which was kind of difficult for me uh, because it was cold and windy and there wa it was flat and barren and I, I really couldn't relate to it. I'm not a landscape photographer. I never really connected to that. And it wasn't until I left there and, and I moved briefly to New York where I met my wife, Kathy. Uh, and, uh, and going from South Dakota to New York was kind of difficult because it was such a, a, a huge uh, uh, transition from being in the middle of nowhere to being in the middle of everything and uh, I didn't I didn't relate to it very easily <coughs> and uh, John McWilliams was here in Atlanta we, were, we had gotten to be very close friends in in college and I heard he was down here so I contacted him and he said they were starting a new photography community here why don't you come down for a visit so we took a, a trip down for a few days uh, and we saw that it was a, uh, a nice community. It was pretty laid back. Uh, it was a much smaller town in 1972. Uh, we had more access to a lot of things. So we ended up moving down here and with John and a few other individuals, uh, we s became the sort of the nucleus of a photography community. Mm -hmm. When did you do your Crossroads book? Uh, that didn't come for, for a while. Uh, that was done in, in uh, it was published in 96 in time for the Olympic Games, and uh, which turned out to not to matter at all. <coughs> but I did the work in 94. But prior, prior to that, uh, I had been working the streets, uh, making pictures like these, uh, although that, that happens to be in, in the book uh, On Common Ground. 
but I was just walking around with my camera, and this, that was, this was made at, at Lenox Square. And uh, I had a, a, a Nikon with a big flash gun sitting on top, and I was just carried around in plain view. And I walked into a clothing store, and the sales clerk walked up to me, and she said, oh, would you take my picture? And she laid down on the floor, just as you see her there. I didn't ask her to do that. I mean, photography is very f funny. Uh, people re respond to it. And she lay down, and I just looked down, and I took that picture against that zigzag floor. I thought it was a terrific picture, but it was the last thing I ever expected to walk away with on that given day. Um, so I spent a lot of time uh, looking at the, uh, at, the, at the visual culture of the city, uh, walking the streets, uh, looking for the unexpected. I was still very uh, interested in candid photography, so-called, and available light photography. Uh, then I uh, explored for a while the uh, flash photography. Uh, I would go to the, the galleries, uh, the demi mond so to speak. Oh, and, the, and the, this stuff was done on the streets. The, the guy on the right was a fixture at Five Points for years. He was totally blind and would stare at the sun uh, and uh, preach. And uh, uh, so I used, to go and, I used to go and talk with him. And then this fellow on the on the right on the left was uh, down on was Whitehall Street at the time, and I stopped to ask him how he got his hair to look like that. And he was Jamaican, and he said, "Beeswax, man, beeswax." So he just demonstrated like that. So one of the things that that I'm very fortunate uh, in is that I because I love to meet people, particularly eccentrics. Uh, and uh, it was just a, a wonderful uh, mechanism for me walking around the city uh, and finding out who lived here. And tell, tell us newcomers and, and young ones here about, about Nexus. Uh, Nexus was begun largely in response to censorship issues at Georgia State University. Uh, it was the 70s and uh, a lot of us were running around half naked and half stoned all the time, uh, or fully naked and completely stoned all the time, <laughs> I suspect, in, in some cases. But uh, just looking back on it, although, with, with, as they say, if you can remember the 60s, you weren't there. Uh, but uh, I had done some, some work uh, that was uh, explicit nudity. And uh, I wanted to show it at the gallery in, at Georgia State. And uh, we, we weren't allowed. And I wasn't the only one doing that. And we weren't allowed to do it. Uh, so we said, well, the hell with them. If they can't take a joke, we'll start our own gallery. So 13 of us uh, uh, grouped together. And, and we rented a little storefront on, uh, in the Virginia Highland neighborhood. And, uh, and the deal was whoever exhibited their work could put up whatever they wanted to, to, to show provided it had integrity. It wasn't that you couldn't show nudity. Nudity was fine, provided it was a solid picture, not gratuitous. Uh, so we, we established a standard, uh, and we stuck to it. And uh, getting to join the organization wasn't that easy. We, we may have been more full of ourselves than, than I realized at the time, but uh, we didn't let just anybody in. We wanted to make sure that they cared about photography as much as we did. Uh, and we chipped in each month and we rented uh, the storefront and we changed exhibits every four or five weeks. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was, uh, and that was the first uh, uh, photography gallery in the city. So tell us about this color work, because this is not a recent color work. No. Uh, in, uh, I'd, I'd gotten a, a grant from the National Endowment uh, to photograph the community where I was raised in Worcester, Massachusetts. And uh, you'll see some of those pictures coming up. But uh, after, after I did that, I applied for a fellowship. And on the basis of the work that I had done uh, in my hometown, they gave me a fellowship. And the difference between a grant and a fellowship is a grant has to have a, be project specific. And a fellowship is free money and say, here, you know, we trust you. Do whatever you'd like with it. So. Uh, I had been working with uh, 8 by 10 inch negative for 10 years, uh, carrying the big camera out into the street. Uh, it was a wonderful way to work. Uh, I call it the, the, wooden, the, the big 8 by 10 Deodorf was a magnetic tool. You'd set it up somewhere, like a totem, 
and people were drawn to it. And uh, so I would set it up in places where I thought uh, people would, be, would look good if it was the right person. So I sort of chose a backdrop and then waited for the right person to come by. And uh, uh, they were make inquiries about the, the camera, so they broke the ice. And uh, I would say, oh yeah, well this is, it, uh, it's not an old fashioned camera, but it's an old fashioned system. Uh, here, let me show you how it works. So I would let them get behind the camera and put the dark cloth over their heads. And I would stand in front of the camera and they would see me upside down and backwards on the ground glass. And it would engage them in the process of making the picture. I said, that's how it works. Now, if you'd like, I'll be happy to make a picture of you. And we'd switch places and I'd put the film holder in and photograph them. And I did that uh, here in Atlanta, and I did that uh, in D.C., and in Baltimore, up and down the East Coast. For about 10 years, I, I worked on, with the big camera. And, uh, but the, the problem with the big camera, as beautiful as, uh, as the quality is, the problem with the big camera is simply that it dictates too often the kind of picture that you make, because you can't be spontaneous with it. I mean, you've got a 60-pound object that's packed up in three cases. You've got a tripod, you've got to open up the camera, it's like a, uh, a big accordion, uh, put the lens on it, cock the lens, open the shutter, get the dark cloth, compose the picture. You know, so you, if you're fast, you can do this in about five minutes. And uh, a lot of pictures go are gone in five minutes. So after a while, uh, I just realized that I kept making the same picture because the, the, the method dictated the type of picture. So when I applied for a fellowship from the, from the endowment and got one, uh, I put away the, the big camera. I bought uh, the state-of-the-art Nikon equipment at the time and all the uh, Kodachrome film uh, with processing that I could afford. And there was a Kodachrome lab in town here at the time. You've probably, some of you heard that the last roll of Kodachrome was just developed uh, a few weeks back, the final roll. Well, but there used to be out on uh, Peachtree Industrial, a lab, so I would go out and, sh and shoot four or five rolls of Kodachrome, run out to Shambly, drop it off there, pick it up at 7.30 the next morning, look through all of my slides and go through it again. And uh, so, th so I, I was tr trying to immerse myself into a color sensibility. Kodachrome is a very unique film. It's beautiful, uh, but very limited. It has a very narrow dynamic range, meaning that uh, if you expose for the highlights, oftentimes you'd lose the shadows that they'd go solid black on you. So that became part of the aesthetic of the film. But anyway, I was walking around downtown Atlanta, and there's this parking deck with a, uh, I'm trying to remember which street, it's on Juniper or one of the side streets downtown. The ground floor is painted this strong color blue, and I look across the street, and this guy in a red leather suit is walking in front of the building. And I looked up and I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> And I'm not religious, but I knew that I got stroke of good fortune. So I yelled to this guy, you, don't move. Stay right where you are. Well, you have to. You know, sometimes you, otherwise you're going to lose a picture. You can see the picture is right there. I mean, it's practically being handed to you on a platter, so you can't let the guy get away. So in as, in as politely a forcible way as I could do it, say, I need to take a picture of you with that red suit against that blue wall. So he smiled, he showed me his gold tooth. And the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, but that's how that picture came about. It was very unexpected, very spontaneous, and that's uh, to this day pretty much the way that I work. Not always that uh, sort of uh, aggressively, but always that, uh, as quickly as I can. And so you experimented with color. This is the 80s, is that? Yes. Yeah. You experimented with color then and you weren't fully satisfied with it because you couldn't control your own printing. Is that, is that right? Yeah, Kodachrome is, is uh, tricky. It would be great for offset printing. You know, the National Geographic would do four color offset or something, but to make prints of your own for a display, the closest you could come would be a dye transfer print, which is a very elaborate, complicated uh, process and very expensive. It would be, on average, about $200 per print for about an eight by 10 print, which was way out of my range. So I, I sat on these slides for a long time and uh, still have a bunch of them I've never done anything with. Right. Uh, but I got frustrated by that fact and I went back to working in black and white. And that brought me back, in, that brought me through the, uh, the 80s and the 90s 
Uh, and then the Hunt brothers. You remember the Hunt brothers from Texas? H.L. Hunt and his, and his uh, cohort brother that uh, uh, cornered the silver market. Uh, and uh, silver became very expensive. The second largest user of silver next to, Eastman Kod uh, next to the U.S. Mint was Eastman Kodak. Uh, and uh, so they started taking, reducing the amount of silver in their films and papers. And uh, for those of you that understand that why that's a bad thing, if you don't, it's because the, bl the black tone in a black and white photograph uh, is directly related to the amount of silver in the material. So it was getting harder to make a, a picture that had a rich outcome uh, in terms of the print. And it, was, it got very exasperating for me and I was ready to quit photography, it was making me crazy. I just couldn't get a picture that I liked. Uh, and then, so I sort of limped through the, the, the last period uh, of the 90s, very exasperated by that. And then uh, people like Ted Malouf, who's sitting right over here, uh, who was one of the earliest proponents that I had met of digital photography, uh, said that, uh, Chip, you know, you really should try. The digital darkroom is really where it's at. And I said, oh, Ted, please. You know, <laughs> don't give me any of that crap. I just, uh, you know, photography is a black and white darkroom thing. He said, well, try it. And eventually I did. Uh, and uh, I've never forgiven him for it, uh, for sort of steering me wrong moving me over to the dark side. But, it, but in fact, uh, it really transformed my life. And uh, so r right at the year 2000, uh, and we're getting, we're moving a little. This, by the way, is uh, the solitary confinement cell at the Atlanta Detention Center. Uh, I was g given access to photograph there. And in order to make this picture, uh, uh, I opened the a slot where the food tray is passed through. And I stuck my wide angle lens through that opening to make, that's all I could say. I had one angle to photograph it from. But that's uh, still a very powerful picture for me. And th this is some of, the, some of the work that I did in my hometown in the Italian neighborhood where I was raised. Uh, the guy on the left is named Joey, appropriately. <laughs> and. Uh, and he was watching me photograph someone else. And uh, I was under the dark cloth with the big camera and I looked out for a second and saw him. And like the guy in the red suit, I looked at him and I said, don't move. Don't move a muscle, I'm gonna take a picture of you just like that. So that's how, that's how these, these came about. And, and Rocco uh, uh, did upholstery and, and uh, with his drunk dog, he had been feeding that dog beer. <laughs> And he had trouble, the dog kept slithering to the ground and it slid him back up. Uh, so I gave Rocco a copy of the picture and he offered to upholster something for me. You know, open-endedly. But, um, and this was other street work that I did with the 8x10 camera. The one behind me here was, was done, the kid with the knife was done in Baltimore. Uh, the one in the middle, the, the one in the middle, sorry about that. Uh, was done in a railroad bridge off of Northside Drive here, right where the Georgia Dome now stands. There was a neighborhood called Lightning, and it was the, the center of moonshine whiskey making for the black community, uh, hence the name Lightning, as in White Lightning. Uh, and uh, I used to go on Sunday afternoons with the camera when the li light was low in the west. Uh, because it was safest then, because there was a lot of drinking that went on in that neighborhood. And uh, if I went during the week, there would be many men there who were both armed and drunk, uh, and they didn't appreciate my being there. So I waited till Sunday afternoons when everything was closed up, and I would go there and photograph these kids that I call the Children of Lightning. And that's what, uh, that was part of that particular project. And uh, Mary, the, uh, who was watching that Afghan, uh, I think she was a working girl. I did that in D.C. Uh, she was a lovely woman, but, but that whole sex, she was right in the section where all the prostitutes hung out uh, on 16th Street in Washington, which, as you know, runs straight down into the White House. Um, but, so I, I left the, uh, the, f the film markings on the edges of that so you could see that, uh, that there was sheet film. 
And this was, this was also, this is where I'm from. This is the neighborhood that I grew up in. Tenement housing like the one on the left, uh, known as Three Deckers up there. And uh, this is the Parkway Diner where I used to hang out. Uh, so there was some publicity about the fact that I was doing the project. So I walked in for, for breakfast, seven o'clock in the morning, and they wanted me to do a picture. And uh, so I had a, uh, a six and a half inch wide angle Dagor lens for my eight by 10, that's 121 millimeter, is that right? Something like the 127 millimeter, covers full eight by 10 negative. And I s had to set it up outside of the space and make a seven second time exposure. So they did a pretty good job of holding still for me for the most part, but that's how that picture came about. And uh, this was, uh, I was hoping Yuri Vaknin would come tonight because this was at his gallery. Remember Vaknin Schwartz Gallery? What was that in the 80s? On Peachtree Street. But this was part of the, the demi monde of Atlanta, sort of the, the underground uh, scene in the, in the gallery community there for a few years. And I, I tried everything to photograph on the street, and, and I love the flash gun. Uh, I'm sort of enamored by Ouija. I, I don't try to be subtle with the flash. I like the flash as a real blunt instrument of illumination, uh, just, like a, just like a news photographer would do it, just throw the, spill the light on everything. Uh, wide angle lens and a, and a big flash gun sitting on top of the camera. And I'll let you figure, figure this one out for yourself. <laughs> Anyone want to guess the one on the left? Go ahead, and say it. That was the original freak, 1964. Yeah, really. Good. You, you weren't here then. You got really no. out of hand. Chip, could we um, move up to your, um, unless you want to say something quickly about these, to say the blue truck image, and we could talk a little bit about yeah, your shift you into color, digital photography in 2000. Sure. Uh, just, just briefly, this was done at Back Street, best party in in the city. Uh, uh, on Halloween, I saw these three guys, two of them in drag, go into the restroom, and I said, oh, this is too much fun. I have to follow them in. And uh, used the flash gun and set it off. No one turned around. They couldn't care less. <laughs> couldn't care less. <laughs> and uh, this, when, this goes a little bit to what, where, where Brett is leading me. Uh, I made these pictures in the 80s and 70s, but I combined them using Photoshop later on once I finally started getting into the digi digital imagery. So there are four images. Uh, they are uh, the verti two, verticals at, two verticals at the end and two horizontals in the center. But the structure of my pictures formali formalistically is so similar that even though these were taken several years apart, the pictures sort of fit rather neatly together and with a little bit of Photoshopping uh, to sort of, uh, you know, join them uh, where they touched. Uh, it comes out as this uh, very, what I th find to be an interesting narrative image. Uh, but those are, well, it is what it is. I won't linger. And uh, this was a picture shot on film with a Leica camera, fast lens, fast film. Uh, 15th of a second at 1.4 on an 800 speed film. I remember it because it was so impossible, the lighting was so ridiculous. We had just come from a swimming party and I asked these young women, who, we were all running, it started to rain, we were all running to the cars and I asked if they would turn and let me photograph them and just as they did, a little hole in the clouds opened up and this ray of warm light came down and I got one frame, that 15th of a second and the hole closed up again and it was over. I mean, sometimes it's the most exciting thing I, I know is to just make a single photograph. And then when, I, when uh, I bought my first digital camera, a little Olympus pocket camera, and I started to experiment, uh, and this was uh, one of the kids, Lucy, what's this kid's name? What is it? Yeah, uh, he lived, he lived uh, around the corner from us? Yeah, and, uh, but I think that's in your backyard. Uh, 
So I, I, was, I was very fascinated by the contrast between this kid standing in front of a hobby horse carrying what looked like a really dangerous weapon, which of course was just a toy, you know, plastic pellet gun thing, but uh, it made for a strong picture. And again, it started uh, uh, to get me interested in going back to color again. Uh, so I, I made, in 1999, I got a phone call from my uh, very dear friend, uh, Jimmy Doyle, who's uh, retired now as a Monsignor in the Catholic Church. And he and I had done a trip in 1970 uh, across country. And uh, Jim had retired, and he said, let's take that trip again, or a part of it. Uh, he lives in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So uh, he flew me out to Sioux Falls. And I was, I, I was sort of in, a, in an awkward place, so I, I, I was trying to make a decision. I was unhappy with black and white, and I was leery of digital technology. So uh, I took two cameras, my Leica for black and white, and then my Nikon for color, uh, and I shot both cameras all the time in the two weeks that we were on the road together. And uh, we went to Vegas and we went to the desert and, you know, uh, and we drove across Wyoming in a blizzard and all this kind of stuff. But when I got back to Atlanta and I looked at the black and white work and I looked at the color work, I never went back to black and white again. I just found that the, the challenges for me uh, were in, in color, was learning to integrate color as another aspect of uh, uh, picture making uh, that I needed to, needed to learn about. So starting around that time, but the first, pi the first picture that uh, got it started was this one, which was done in Sioux Falls in January of 2000. And I realized when I was making this picture that I had never seen anything quite like that before. Not that I hadn't seen old trucks and you know, stuff like that, but uh, that beautiful shade of blue in, in this very austere, almost, almost pure white background and the simplicity of it and the abstraction of it uh, really, you know, flipped a switch for me. And uh, I realized then that, that I could see in another way and see uh, powerfully uh, by integrating color into the work and that became the mission and f for, for that next period of time and then extending uh, on f into the first few years of that decade, of this past decade, uh, I needed to learn about color, what, what my relationship was uh, to it, uh, how I could integrate it into the picture without making the picture either sentimental or too pretty or picturesque. It had to have the same amount of uh, integrity, same degree of integrity, and gravitas, significance, uh, emotional weight, whatever you want to attribute to it, as all of the other components of the picture, the lighting, uh, the, uh, uh, the composition, uh, the subject matter, of course. And uh, it's, it, so it finally got to the point where if everything worked but the color didn't work, <coughs> I wouldn't make the picture. It had to be a, a part of it. And... Uh, so I, I, I think what you'll see, uh, if you go next door to see the exhibit from here, you'll see that color is now a very uh, prominent and, and uh, forceful uh, aspect of all of the pictures. In some cases, it's less apparent, uh, and the subject matter might carry the weight. In other pictures, the color itself really becomes a very dominant factor but it's become something now that uh, is as, as important to me as anything has ever been uh, for me. Do you think it was the, um, that white tundra landscape where there's almost no color at all that helped you realize this blue truck sitting in this snowy landscape, white sky, the power, the emotional power of color, do you think that's, is that where it hit you or did it hit you when you came back? Uh, no, I, I knew it then. I knew it then. I mean, I sat there. I was, it was snowing, and I had flown in from Atlanta, <coughs> uh, and I, I hadn't adjusted to being back in, in South Dakota climate. And of course, it was January. So I, I had borrowed my friend's car to just go out for a few hours, 
And I just sat there and stared at that. Uh, I'll bring it back. Uh, I just stared at it. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, that there was something that beautiful. I mean, to me, uh, that, that beautiful, this uh, serendipitous moment uh, where so many important things, emotional things, were contained in the scene, uh, and I could see them very clearly. And uh, uh, so I just sat there. I never got out of the car because I didn't want to make footprints. I wanted to keep it, keep my own presence to a minimum in the picture, you know. Uh, but yeah, I think that this one really uh, s set me off in a direction where I realized the color was going to become important and it ended up taking several years for me to develop a, a rapport with it uh, where I wasn't self-conscious about it uh, or f feeling that I was forcing the color onto the picture. It had to, as the street hustlers say, it has to play natural. You right. Know? So and I, for me, I really love this little yellow line, actually, right. on the left-hand side. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a very important picture to me. Could you talk, go to the next image and talk a little bit about, um, about your interest in, or, or the Maryland, maybe, maybe the Maryland. And this is one of the most popular pictures in the, in the show, and people like to stand in front of it, I've found, and, and just wonder at what they're looking at. And, and you like to create these pictures that have uh, something disorienting about the perception in them and, and the, a, a, in the depth. Could you talk a little bit about, um, about your interest in, in that? Uh, one of the things about growing up in the inner city, and John McWilliams and I used to talk about this when we were at RISD. Uh, John ca uh, came from the Western Massachusetts in the Berkshires, the, which are the hills of Western Massachusetts. And uh, his, his family owned half a mountain out there, and they had riding trails. And, uh, so, and John was a landscape photographer. I mean, I could see where he would connect to, the, to the, the natural landscape. I grew up in the inner city where you had very shallow spaces, uh, alleyways, large buildings, sidewalks going directly up to buildings, very few trees, uh, very little open expanse. Uh, so what I connect to mostly to this day is a shallow space. And, uh, uh, or a better way of looking at it is that I tried to pull all of the material up to the picture plane, because I worship the picture plane, frankly. I mean, uh, I, I have this uh, tremendous love affair with the or, uh, organization of the picture plane. I'm a, a devout Euclidean. I, I love the, the awareness of the grid, uh, uh, you know, the sort of uh, imaginary projection of, of, uh, of a grid on top of everything. And uh, uh, so when, when I see pictures like this, everything is forced up to the, the surface of the picture. And this is a, a display window for a lighting uh, fixture store uh, on the, the, uh, in the neighborhood where I grew up. It's called Shrewsbury Street. And uh, this particular uh, photograph of Marilyn Monroe had been converted into a, a lighting fixture. She actually, you can plug her in. Uh, uh, because the earrings and the necklace, the necklace was fiber optic and the earrings were, were, were little lights, little light, tiny light bulbs. And uh, uh, you can just begin to see here, that's the edge of the frame. See it? That's, a, that's the picture frame that's holding her image. Uh, and it just blended beautifully. It was an overcast day, which is another one of my favorite kinds of days to work in because the, the, the shadows are soft, the color is cooler. Uh, but she was so orange and yellow that she jumped right out uh, of the picture plane so beautifully. And, uh, and then there was this limited color palette, uh, the sort of silvery whites of the lampshades uh, and the crystal. And then it was her and those red drapes. Uh, and I will, uh, will admit, and I, I've enjoyed doing this, that this little thing right here, you see it? It's a little vase, little vase right there. The lower, lower part of it was originally turquoise. See, I'd gotten good enough with Photoshop. 
that uh, I, I made the print and I said, you know, this would be a great picture if there wasn't just that little distracting s spot of turquoise. So in Photoshop, I used my color picker and I they said, okay, that's the color you want to get rid of. What color would you like to change it to? And I picked something out of the curtain and I pressed OK. And three seconds later, that turquoise pot was a red pot. This is, I think, a really important point because, and, and maybe you can say something about you as a street photographer as opposed to you as a you know, documentary photographer. Right. And um, you know, I think those two concepts sometimes get confused and it's an important distinction for you. Um, in some ways you're creating a portrait of Atlanta with the work that you have in the galleries, but it's a, it's a lyrical portrait and it's not, <clears throat> it's not something that's, that where you're attempting to convey an objective reality, it's your reality. And, um, and so manipulation of the image is something that you're very comfortable with. Oh, abso absolutely. And of course, photography has always been manipulated. So Photoshop isn't anything new in that respect. It's just more sophisticated. Uh, we've always made parts of pictures lighter and darker and cropped them and, and did everything we knew to do. Uh, but no, I'm not a documentary photographer. Uh, I'm not interested in uh, the, the facts of the, of the matter. I'm only interested in what happens to the picture after I've seen it uh, and after I've uh, uh, had an opportunity to try to transform it into something other than what it first appeared to be. Uh, I recently compared uh, making some of these pictures to uh, a chef doing a reduction. Uh, and, and by that I mean, you know, you've, you're taking physical space, all of this physical space, and you're, com you're compressing it down to a picture. In my case, they're like nine by 12 inches. And there's a lot of material that you're squeezing down into that space. And, and uh, so you, what you end up with is uh, really uh, intensely rich flavors. Uh, the color works that way, the textures work that way. It really intensifies the subject. And that's what I think photography does most powerfully, is, is uh, it takes something from the real world, it converts it to a two-dimensional form with a three-dimensional illusion, uh, but it, it fills it with uh, the most potent form of itself uh, by, by reference uh, so that you can feel the colors with greater intensity and you can feel the textures with greater uh, intensity. Uh, and I think that that's really the, the key to making a strong picture is to uh, is to uh, use it as a way of intensifying the subject. A documentary photograph has an obligation to someone else's truth. And I'm not interested in anybody else's. This is, I'm interested in the poetic truth. I'm interested in the poet's truth. The, the thing that matters to me as I've expressed it here. And I'm reliant on the subject matter before me because that's what photography does. Uh, I've been very uh, made curious in, in recent years by the number of people who claim to be photographers but seem to really dislike what photography do it does inherently, just to make a sharp picture, uh, you know, with, with clarity. And uh, a lot of people want to soften it and make it look like brush strokes or make it look like a bad lens or make, make it look, look like something other than a photographic image. But to me, photography is is the ultimate modernist art. I mean, you're, it's machine made. You have a mechanical instrument that you're starting with. It's not a paintbrush, it's not a stick of charcoal. Uh, and I have high regard for uh, th those things about photography uh, that allow me to do so much with it. So it's all of, all of the bells and whistles, so to speak, that photography puts in your hands in the form of a camera and now in post-production to be able to uh, transform the picture uh, Quite, take it quite away from its original uh, context and, and build for it another context that is really rooted in my reality and uh, uh, or as uh, uh, Rene Rilke said to tr try to find a beauty try to find in it a beauty of one's own and that's what I try to do with my pictures is to make pictures that f for me reveal some kind of underlying beauty that's present in what it is that I've seen um, I'd like just, we're running out of time, but I'd like if there are any questions um, 
to, to open it up to the audience. Yes. She's curious about the size of your prints and um, and uh, why you choose that uh, format for photography. Why I keep them at, th at that scale? Uh, I think they're big enough. Uh, no, seriously. I mean, I've I've thought about it. The picture for me has always been right here. Uh, I'm. Uh, I think I prefer to have my work looked at in an intimate setting in an intimate way and uh, I mean it's kind of startling for me to see these things this huge uh, I get a kick out of it frankly but uh, uh, making a picture too big can sometimes uh, take away some of its power uh, particularly its ability to draw someone in close to it so that you in the process uh, have to uh, remove yourself from a anything else that you can see and that the photograph that, that of mine that you're looking at is the only thing you've got room to notice in, in your field of vision. So I really like that. And the pictures that I have in the show for me are still very large uh, compared to the way I used to make pictures. Uh, when, when we were in college, uh, you know, a picture that was maybe four by six was big enough. I mean, you know, it, it seems silly in comparison now, but. Uh, we, we were concerned more with re, uh, quality retention, so we didn't want to enlarge your picture very much. Uh, we just want to make it big enough so you could see it and feel what it was about. So for me, a 9 by 12 inch image is actually pretty s substantial. I mean, some of them would hold up bigger, but I don't have that much interest in doing it. There's a question in the back. Hi, um, I noticed a lot of your um, earlier work uh, is very human, and you shoot you shot a lot of people. Whereas a lot of this recent work is much more these sort of curious moments that you're discovering in the landscape. I wonder if that's been, you know, conscious or your thoughts on that. If we had another gallery, I could have put in more pictures. <laughs> Those were, those were edited down from 125. They were all pretty much ready to, to go. Um, I, th I think in terms of the exhibition and what, what I was intending to do, which was to show a single vision, a, s a singular vision, uh, as it uh, can be manifest in many different forms. Uh, and that by placing pictures in proximity to one another, you could uh, enhance the, that statement. You could, you could intensify, and I come back to that word, uh, that, that's uh, the statement of the, the power of how, how these pictures are seen by showing others that are similar to it. So it tended to get tilted toward, let's say, less figurative and more abstracted kinds of pictures. Which is, which is where it went toward the latter part of the decade anyway, as I was getting more into that. Uh, but it's only, it's, it's one way to show some of the work that I've done and to make the point uh, about how I see pictures and uh, using the installation itself uh, as a mechanism for uh, articulating that statement with greater power and clarity. Does that answer your question? Okay. We could do um, one more, I think. Uh, oh, In the back. Oh, I was just um, wondering how you made the picture with the frogs. Which? The picture with the frogs. With the frogs? Yes. Oh, you mean the, the couple kissing? The one? Um, oh. Yes. Yeah. Uh, th actually, that's, th it used to, there was a uh, shopping, uh, complex uh, that had those in it. Charlie Ackerman, a very adventuresome developer here in town, built a place on uh, North Avenue and uh, Piedmont Road that had a, a huge uh, uh, like globe, 
like it was 30 feet tall and a, and a reflecting pool that had all of these gold frogs sitting in it. Uh, it's one of those pictures I wish I could go back and do in color, but the place is gone. Uh, and uh, I happen to know the couple uh, Uh, here and I was I was watching them. They were pregnant and engaged, and uh, I see you back there. I see you, Taylor. Yeah. Okay. Relax. Just a second. Just a second. No. Uh, so when I when I uh, saw saw all of those things put together, I thought it had a kind of surreality to it that I thought was pretty neat. Taylor? Yes, just a question about the uh, yellow, the two, two back. Okay. Do you, oh, oh. Hi. Um, it's the one that you had, well, the parking structure. Did you know, I mean, you know that that's the Trong Loi. It's tricking out your eye because it's really some sort of, it's how it's expressed. And you don't really know how far the distance is between the two red posts and the yellow. Did you know before you even looked through the viewfinder that it was going to trick your eye? Or did it just come to you when you looked at, looked through the viewfinder itself that you actually saw it was going to trick you? I, I knew. I mean, I've got the viewfinder built into my eye now. You know? So you, re okay, okay. I mean, I, I, can, I can envision the way the camera sees things. Sure. Sort of like Hitchcock would. I, I mean, he already knew before he, he did it. Yeah, I, don't, I, I can't speak to that. I don't know. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chip. Um, let's give him a round of applause. I want to make a little push before you leave. Um, don't forget that uh, November, as, as sad as we are to see Chip's show come down, other things will be going up. Ralph Gibson will go up, and he will be here on the 10th to deliver a lecture. Um, so don't forget to come back for that. And Thomas Struth will be here on November 1st, a uh, big event with uh, Glenn Lowry, the director of Museum of Modern Art. So please join us for both of those events, and thanks for coming tonight. And the galleries are open if you'd like to go visit the show.